one of our final sessions of the day the, the, on the evolving state of affairs in Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, Pakistan. Um, I'll briefly introduce the panelists and uh, then invite them to make a few opening remarks, and then we'll, we'll have a discussion, and I'll, I'll open it up to the audience. Um, starting from the, the far end, uh, Shafkat Mahmoud is a leading figure in uh, Pakistan, Tariq e Insaf, which is Imran Khan's a party which is doing extremely well, as you know, in the polls in Pakistan. Um, he's many years in public service in, in Pakistan, been a minister, um, and, and now has joined this party, uh, played a role, a, a leading role in, in setting up the PTI. Um, then moving uh, along, Abid Bhatt is the chief executive officer of E2E Supply Chain Management. Now, E2E Supply Chain Management is one of the is the fastest growing company in Pakistan. Um, it's a logistics company, and, and Abid is, is really perfect for this panel because he's the personification, if you like, of the Silk Route. His company does business in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and in Central Asia um, in the logistics business, and I think he'd like to develop regional trade and do more business with India, if I'm right in saying that. So uh, he's, it would be great to have him on to represent the private sector here. Um, then Dr. Sabah Yusuf Toma al Mali is, is the Vice Minister of Planning in the Kurdistan Regional Government of Iraq. He served for 12 years in the Planning Ministry in Iraq. Then he moved to the UK and taught in, at Liverpool University and, and at Coventry too, um, before being, being asked to return to, to a role in, in the Kurdistan Government. Um, he tells me he's a technocrat, not a politician, but uh, anyway, we're very glad to have him along. Um, and then, and then Sham Batija is uh, the senior economic advisor to President Karzai. Um, he's also got a long, distinguished career um, in the United Nations. He's been the Secretary General's special representative for Central Asia, West Asia, South Asia, and the League of Arab States. Um, he also launched in, Ast in Istanbul in 2010 uh, the Silk Route Initiative. So again, someone who can talk very much about reg the region and regional trade. So, so let me start with, with you, Sham, and ask you to, to just give us a few words about your vision for Afghanistan, your vision for the region, and the partnerships you'd like to see here at, at the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much, Simon. First of all, greetings to all of you. It's a pleasure to see the World Economic Forum while this is in India and a little bit focused on India, but now this session, our hopefully future sessions, will also include other countries within the region, let's say from South Asia. So it's a really pleasure to be there from, from, from that perspective. On Afghanistan, I need not to say much more. You have a distinguished journalistic career yourself, so you know what has happened in the past 30 years and what this country has gone through. Uh, the whole social fabric, economic fabric, institutional fabric, infrastructure fabric of the country was uh, devastated. And, 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 and suffered for all these years. Naturally, Afghanistan was and is continued to be a least developed country from that point of view. It's also a landlocked country, so it's no different than what we have gone through we never had before, but whatever we had was already gone through it. Now, what we have gone through all this with the help of the donor community, particularly the United States, uh, we have come uh, quite a bit in, in, in economic achievements. Uh, the newspapers and the journals and the news coverage is full of it. Um, a country which basically had a $200, uh, $100 uh, income now today is having $600. Uh, we had only 72,000 uh, telephone lines today. We have uh, millions and millions of lines. Almost, I would say, half of the country has a mobile phone. Uh, and others in the roads, the, the amount of roads we have built in, in, in our country in the past uh, 10 years, which we had never built in the entire history of Afghanistan. We have connected very well to the whole region and so on. The, the country which basically did not have a place in, in the global terms, today is seeking to find its own place and of course contributing in, in, in many ways we can. And we'd like to continue on that path. Uh, Afghanistan is a landlocked country which uh, in, in, in normal terms we are blocked from all angles. But we'd like to turn around, at least this is what my vision is, to change this landlocked status to a, a sort of serving status to a more land bridge status, which means 
uh, I like to see Afghanistan to to become a, a a trade, transit, transport, and investment hub, not only for the for the country itself, but for the Central Asia, South Asia, as well as West Asia, because the country's location itself dictates and has been in the past in the history, uh, like like we have been crossing roads for basically uh, all the regions and so on, and we like to build upon it. We also like to build, this is our more or less vision for it, a very close relationship within the region itself. We have joined many international and as well as regional uh, uh, structures and in intergovernmental uh, associations. We have a like SARC, we have become member. We are members of the ECO, which is Economic Cooperation Organization, Shanghai Corporations, and many such institutions. We like to continue to, to, to be part of it, contribute through them, as well as within the region. These are the very few sort of examples that I wanted to start with. And of course, we have a more session to continue, and we'd be delighted to contribute more on that. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Saba, I'll, I'll move on to you. Thanks, Simon. Good evening. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Ali Sindhi, Minister of Planning, was supposed to be here. Um, but he has got another arrangement with the discussion about the budget, and he sent his regards and his wishes. It is my honor to be here with you uh, today to participate in this important discussion. I would like to highlight some hot issue in the Middle East, Iraq, Kurdistan, and the role of U.S. and Western country and India. Although the Middle East has for many years been in a turbulent state, it is without doubt currently facing some of the uh, most challenging issue, the outcome of which will have not only regional impact, but global repercussion. What is widely termed the Arab Spring suggests a systematic change and sense of purpose and unity, whilst there, are, there may be commonality in different peoples expressing their dissatisfaction with the status quo there, the similarity ends. The Middle East can be considered a geopolitical region, but the individual countries and communities within these countries are each unique and facing unique challenges. Some have great natural resources, whilst many do not. Some have open, democratic, and accountable government and many do not. Some have enjoyed many years of peace, stability, and prosperity, whereas many others have suffered for instability, civil war, political and economic uncertainty, and poverty. Against this backdrop, there are many, many people who have lived for decades under authoritarian rule and political stagnation, suddenly finding they have overnight become responsible for determining the course of their future, such as the scale and pace of change. That much of the world, as well as those across the region, are unable to fully determine the outcomes and ultimate where this change will take the region, even in Iraq. Where tremendous change came nearly a decade ago with the liberation by US and coalition forces, political deadlock in Baghdad, and ongoing concern over a perceived lack of security in much of the country, mean many questions still remain about the future. This is especially alarming to us who live in Kurdistan region, as we have spent almost 20 years laying the necessary foundations for free, democratic, and safe society while seeking to maintain and strengthen communication and cooperation with the rest of Iraq. What is clear to us from where 
we stand in Erbil today without proper leadership of and, and engagement with the ordinary citizen, what can begin as positive change can quickly transform to unrest and uncertainty. The role of the West in trying to support positive change has had limited success at best and in many cases had led to resentment, confusion, and provided fertile ground for those intent on personal political gain at the expense of the citizen. Outside the Kurdistan region, within Iraq, for example, the U.S. decision to withdraw in 2011 in response to domestic pressure left a vacuum that is being exploited by those within a very different agenda. Likewise, the seemingly impotent ability of the UN to effectively address the Syrian issue such that the conflict now has real potential to destabilize the region. This is why we believe it is essential for those such as the US who have the capacity to play a much greater political and diplomatic role in the region must step up to the plate. It's understandable that the Obama administration has remained apprehensive to take up strong position on a particular issue due to domestic, political, and economic concern at home. But we believe that the longer American waits, the more difficult it will be for it to demonstrate the much needed leadership, especially to galvanize and mobilize international and, and regional allies. This leadership is key to overcoming the individual agendas and thereby ensuring the cooperation necessary for resolving the region's greatest issue. Speaking particularly to the situation in Kurdistan, we would like to see the U.S. and its allies play a more active role in the social and economic development of our region. Today, through strong political channels, dialogue, and economic cooperation, we maintain good relations with our, all our neighbors and stand as an area of great stability in the region and are therefore not only a political asset for the West, but prove that pragmatic cooperation is possible in the Middle East. However, we also have a booming economy, open for investment, and a young population eager for education and skills, both areas too, which we believe the U.S. and others can contribute a great deal, and where we believe there is a significant room to reinforce our strong political ties and sustain a long-lasting, mutually beneficial relationship that can act as a beacon in a very uncertain region. On the question of the strategic role of India, I believe India as the economic and political hub of South Asia can play a much greater role in the overall development of the region and generally contribute to greater stability. India had, has developed quickly and has faced many of the same social and political issues that countries throughout the Middle East are facing. We in the Middle East can therefore learn a great deal from the Indian experience and from Indian expertise. And further cooperation in this regard should be encouraged by both sides. The potential for enhanced trade relationship, especially between India and Middle East countries outside the Gulf region is also great. Generally speaking, the more positive economic and social relationship the region can establish with India, the greater chances these contributions have to reinforce stability 
and growth throughout the region. Thanks very much, uh, Saba. I, I want to come back to several of the points you, you raised there um, through the course of our discussion today. I mean, particularly um, the U.S. role, the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, and we can talk about that in relation to Afghanistan as well, and the U.S. role in Pakistan and what that should be. Um, I, I'll move on, though, to, to, to invite Av Avid to speak. <coughs> and, and fairly obviously, Av Avid, you want regional cooperation, regional trade. I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's standing in the way of that. Uh, you know, from your perspective, um, the, the dream that, that you know, is, is shown by the Silk Route that, that Cham laid out for Afghanistan is a, is a dream which Pakistan obviously can be central to, but, but why isn't it happening as fast as it should be? Firstly, I'd like to, uh, I, I'll, I'll come back to that question, I, I, but I'd like to um, firstly say it's, it's really not fair to clump Pakistan together with Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, no <laughs> offense, um, because we, we have, we're not going through you know, a fully fledged uh, conflict inside of Pakistan. Sure. Um, uh, so, and um, we have a running government, uh, we have uh, an economy that works, and uh, as such, the U.S. role is important, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's not a do or die, uh, as, as it, it, it would be for, for the others, other sure. two, probably. Um, the, uh, as far as um, my vision for this region, for this entire region, now the Silk Route starts from uh, Ch China, it goes all the way onto Europe. Uh, but this Pakistan, Afghanistan, India are sort of central to the Silk Route uh, uh, also. And Pakistan is the, is the first, land uh, first country with a port. Uh, uh, um, after Afghanistan, that so it gives access, potential access to. If we don't even include India, it gives potential access to uh, um, markets. Or, you know, for for markets in Central Asia and Afghanistan, Pakistan can be the uh, origin, can be the port that they <coughs> that they use. What's stopping uh, the Silk Route uh, from from uh, getting revitalized, from getting reinvoked, is um, the, obviously, the critical relation between Pakistan and India. And um, uh, what businesses would like to see, because this is not something that the government would one day say, okay, we, uh, let's, uh, the Silk Route is this road here, and please follow the signs, and you will get to Europe. It's not going to how it's going to work. It's going to be businesses saying, this is now viable to use, and uh, let's, and let's talk, talk about using them. And I think what's, what's stopping is that... Uh, there is no stability in policy on both sides, um, on Pakistan or uh, or on the, even on the Indian side, as far as you know, enhancing cooperation and uh, is concerned. We as businesses sometimes feel that if policies are reversible, then they are as good as not being there in the first place, because this this uh, uh, the sword of uh, uncertainty hanging, uh, you know. Uh, on our on our heads is is enough for us to not engage. I mean, there are other things to do. Uh, we will you know uh, disengage in that situation. So that's something leaders on both sides will have to look at. I think India has a huge role to play. It's, we I look at it as a much more mature democ hugely mature democracy, much more mature economy. Uh, everything we can learn from uh, India, uh, even as a, as, a, as a Pakistani, uh, and so India has to play, uh, as my colleagues earlier mentioned, has to play a sort of a big brother role. Um, where they help create an environment uh, such that this could happen. Of course, everybody has their work cut out for them. Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Central Asia, Iraq, all these countries have their work cut out for them. But leadership is needed. Very much so like Germany did in, in making the uh, uh, European Union. Germany was a, was a critical leader in that, although France and, uh, was also there. I mean, uh, my French... Friends would not like me to say that, but it's, it's a reality that without Germany and without the, their sacrifices, uh, it wouldn't have been. They really, really are sacrifices. If, if you, uh, on, the, on the economic side at least, their sacrifices, EU wouldn't be a reality. Similarly, we have to think about such a trading block or such a uh, 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 trade-free zone uh, uh, in this region, and and for that to happen, India has to uh, be there also as a leader, but everybody also has to follow. Simon, I just yeah, want please, to, yeah. in, um, Jump in. Uh, certainly I, I don't want to take uh, the, 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 the place, 
But he said something so interesting, which is, uh, in matter of fact, the heart to us, as well as to the entire South Asia. The SAFTA. For example, the SAFTA Treaty or SAFTA Agreement, which has been negotiated within the framework of the SARC region, which basically provides a, a fantastic uh, yeah. platform and framework for expanding and developing more trade, and in, in, in a free trade manner. I'm, I'm really uh, um, thankful that you mentioned, because this is one thing we both uh, have to be a little bit pursuing uh, at the SARC sessions, as well as persuading India and many other countries to join in and so on. This will help us a lot in that sense. Very rightly point. Sure. Thank you. India-Pakistan relations have a habit of uh, sucking up all of the attention at SARC meetings, and I don't want to make our whole session <laughs> about India-Pakistan relations, but, but, but uh, I will bring in Shafkat here to talk a little bit about that. I mean, India and Pakistan relations are central to developing any of these, these ideas that we're talking about. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about, about PTI and whether you can promise stability and assurance of you know, in terms of India-Pakistan relations, such that the next time we're discussing the, this at the World Economic Forum, we have a packed room full of Indian businessmen who are dying to do business in this region. Um, you know, is that, is that <coughs> something which is realizable? So you don't want me to talk about our vision for Pakistan? Well, I do want you to talk about that as well, but I, I, want, you to, I want you to Because address uh, we are a political party which is going into an election soon, so we have a vision for Pakistan. Please. But uh, I'll try and first answer your question. I mean, part of our vision is that we need to have, we uh, aim to build an entirely new relationship with uh, India. And as a matter of fact, the United States, so we can talk about that later on. And a part of this uh, building up an entirely new relationship is uh, that we must create trust between our uh, two nations. Because unless and until we create trust, then, uh, you know, whatever uh, detailed and steps that you take on other matters will not go very far. <clears throat> and I think uh, uh, we want to address some of the main issues, and I think those issues can be resolved, uh, and they can be, Kashmir can be resolved, Siachen can be resolved, Sir Creek can be resolved, even water, which is a more tricky subject, can somehow be resolved. But there has to be a will, and there has to be strong political uh, leadership, because uh, if you don't have strong political leadership, then other uh, uh, interest groups within the country, as well as uh, within uh, the, the state, start to intervene. So that creates a problem, and that creates a problem not just in Pakistan, but in India also. Because uh, sometimes I, I hear Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, and I feel that he has this very strong desire to move very fast on uh, having um, a, you know, very normal, peaceful relationship. But sometimes one gets the feeling that there are uh, elements within the state who, and you know, you get uh, uh, the Indian Army chief and others saying things which are uh, uh, cautionary. I'll, I'll, be, I'll use a careful word. <laughs> and similarly in, uh, in, in Pakistan. So I think that we would need uh, <clears throat> a strong... Uh, leadership on both sides to overcome many of the, the hurdles. And uh, if we win the election, I promise you one thing, uh, there is going to be strong leadership. And there is, we, we have no ambiguity in our mind that, uh, that uh, our government would, according to the Constitution, take all the decisions. And if there is any uh, reason for us not being able to work according to the Constitution, we'll go back to the people. So therefore, uh, but I, we, 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 there has to be partnership. There has to be partnership for moving forward uh, on the Indian side also. I think we have missed opportunities in the past, both of us. But um, I, I believe that uh, there have been occasions when uh, both sides have been very close to some kind of a settlement on Kashmir. In our party, as uh, uh, Mr. Imran Khan is fond of saying, is we have three former foreign ministers. And all, all of them tell us in different periods that they came very close to resolving uh, Kashmir or having some kind of a, a settlement uh, on Kashmir. And then at the last minute, something happened. I believe the last time was 2007, early 2007, uh, when there was 
later on some political crisis and it didn't get back. So we have basis of moving forward on some of the key contentious issues. And because once we are able to make progress on them, everything else will follow. On trade, for example, uh, we are very keen on trade. We, are, we, we feel that uh, it is in our national interest to have a very strong trading relationship uh, with, with India. And uh, SAFTA is a platform, which is a good platform. There are lots of things that have to be worked out on it. Um, but um, even on the, in the economic area, there are sticking issues. Uh, there are tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, all sorts of things that need to be uh, resolved. So, but again, I say that if you have the will and the strong leadership to move forward, you can do that. It can happen. Also, people-to-people -people links. Uh, we are very, very keen on... I mean, if, uh, again, if we come into power, you will see, um, I mean, a hugely liberalized visa regime in the sense that you will see uh, possibilities of, uh, we are, and we are even willing to take unilateral steps to increase uh, the, um, uh, you know, arrival of people from India into Pakistan. And there is a tremendous potential for, uh, all kinds of tourism, uh, religious tourism, and so on. But people-to-people -people contacts are essential, and I was. Uh, uh, that's why I'm looking forward to this uh, visit of the Pakistani cricket team to uh, India uh, in December. And although there are some voices in India who are objecting, but I think that we need to uh, move forward and create an environment where uh, we can interact uh, on levels which are other than defend security and other things. So I think this is, so I, I, I'm very positive. I'm very positive about uh, the future of uh, India-Pakistan relationships. And the greatest reason for this positivity is that among the people of Pakistan, you f see this very, very strong desire to uh, move forward uh, towards a, a very peaceful, normalized relationship. And the realization, very strong realization that Sark region as a whole has, uh, in a sense, uh, unlike in other parts of the world, not moved forward because of all these security related issues and so on and so forth. Whereas other regional blocks are doing much better uh, than Sark. So if you are able to overcome some of our uh, security related and uh, historical narratives and so on and so forth, we'll be able to uh, de not only bilaterally move forward, but as a region be able to, because at the end of the day, it's the prosperity of your people, because that's what matters at the end of the day. Everything else is secondary to that, and prosperity of the people essentially comes through economic development, cooperation. So we have to all move forward on that. So I think at the moment on this issue, I'll just... Sure, this thanks very much. Uh, I mean, let's, let's since we have had... Uh, the U.S. election today, and I'll shift gears for a second. Now, we can come back to the regional Silk Route issues, and I'm sure people will want to talk about that. But, but you know, we have another four years of Obama. We've just had four years. I mean, Shavkat, let me start with you. What's four years of Obama been like for Pakistan, and, and what are you looking for in the next four? How do you, how do you feel about the result today? I, I think that we've had very difficult four years with uh, President Obama, although the expectations were higher when he was elected. Uh, and uh, incidentally, uh, President Obama perhaps uh, uh, was one of the few people who as a young man visited Pakistan, stayed here, so he, kn he knew, knows the country. And But this has been a testy period because of, uh, 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 you know, not no little convergence on uh, understanding of security issues. Um, there has been a strong reaction in Pakistan to uh, drone attacks uh, which kill a lot of people besides militants kill a lot of have a lot of collateral damage uh, there has been uh, a Salala attack on our military which kill, killed 22 people which were, became a, a, a very serious issue between the US and Pakistan with the result that uh, the NATO supply line was stopped for almost six months I think and eight months eight months uh, the supply chain <laughs> so you would know <laughs> so uh, Besides that, even on uh, uh, economic, I mean, Pakistan has been pushing for a long time for not aid uh, as such, but uh, freer access to uh, American markets uh, for its products. That didn't happen. 
So it has been a, uh, a testy period, but uh, what we are hoping that it will change. Uh, it will change because um, uh, a strong realization, um, uh, historically true, that uh, when presidents get elected for second term, uh, political considerations and uh, you know playing to the, the the various opinion groups becomes less of a consideration. So we feel that, uh, and also the public opinion in United States is now very much for uh, American exit from this region. So we hope that uh, issues of drone strikes, and I can tell you a whole reason why we feel that these are counterproductive. I mean, now studies are coming from the United States, from Stanford and New York law schools, which have documented how uh, drone strikes have actually increased militancy than, uh, rather than reducing it. Uh, so well, we hope that uh, in the next four years, and if we get elected, that is, we will be able to convince uh, the United States that uh, by being here and doing all this, they are giving a jihadi narrative to uh, those militants who are then able to convince the people that this is a war against infidels. And as long as you have this jihadi narrative, it becomes very difficult to uh, negotiate uh, peace with people because uh, they, they see this in, a, in very different terms. It leads to suicide bombing because, and we have suffered, by the way, I, it's not generally known that we have lost close to 40,000 people um, over the last seven, seven, eight years in terrorist attacks. And uh, so, uh, and one of, the, and through mostly through suicide bombings and suicide bombings narrative is uh, built in because uh, the, these militants and hardcore elements can tell these people that look, you are fighting against uh, uh, infidels and Pakistan government is partner of infidels and so on. So, so that's a long subject. I don't want to, uh, but what I'm saying is that we hope to convince the United States that it's in our common national interest that we need to rethink this entire strategy of fighting militancy. And we need to isolate and wean away as many people, win hearts and minds in a true sense, so that we are able to minimize the number of hardcore militants and then we can take them on. So I think uh, on that side, uh, on, on trade and aid, uh, our party's line is we don't want USAID. We are, we, are, we are going to, we are determined that we must stand on our feet and we have very clearly feel that USAID is counterproductive. And, instead of helping us creates a problem. So therefore, we are not interested in USAID. We need to in increase our own revenue base so that we don't need to uh, seek uh, USAID. But it will be not, we are not anti-United States. We want to build a new relationship, a di different kind of relationship. And hopefully, in Obama's second term, that will happen. So. Well, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring Sham in here. I mean, Shavkat's talked about a different kind of US engagement, not, not a drone strike one, not a not an aid one, but a trade one. I mean, where Asaba where talked about his concern about the US disengagement from Iraq. So, you know, in Afghanistan, are, we, are you concerned that the pullout of troops is either too rapid or will lead to a, a disengagement in other ways, a disengagement, a political, diplomatic, economic disengagement from Afghanistan, which will be destabilizing as well? So, I mean, how do you view that in, in the prism of another four years of, of, of President Obama? Right, Simon. Uh, <laughs> I will take you a little back in academic terms. Once uh, Professor Hans Morgenthau was asked, how will you define superpower? Uh -huh. So he answered back, he says, well, uh, superpower is an entity, institution, a country, whatever you can call it, which has a global interest. Mm -hmm. Within that context, the United States was there in our region, particularly in Afghanistan, what happened in the past 30 years, and we are thankful to them. We are thankful to the international community who has come to Afghanistan to help us build, as I earlier said, our entire infrastructure, political institutions, and, and, and so on and on. Within that context, you also know that last year, we, President Obama did come to Kabul at the last minute. We did sign a, a, an agreement a strategic partnership. Within strategic partnership, almost not necessarily military, political, and so on, also economic issues are included in that. In that partnership and with our engagement with the United States, uh, when the time comes ready for something, they know it, we know it, 
then it's time to move on to the next phase of it. Uh, within the uh, context of Afghanistan, Afghans have defended their country since the birth of it. I need not to say that the history book says it. <laughs> and we will continue to do so. The British know that very well. Well, so, yeah. exactly. You know, <laughs> so this will, we will continue to do so. So this was a very direct dialogue between us and them. They say they want to withdraw. They want to leave. So it be. It's a perfect. So they have helped us quite a bit to prepare ourselves, our police force, our military force. Our, basically, we are ready to move on. So within that context, if the United States leaves, and they have made the decision to leave by uh, 2014, and President Obama already uh, at various meetings that I have uh, participated, uh, in a slow phase withdrawal, uh, that will continue to do so, and will prepare us to, to take over back our own institutions, uh, and, and we are ready for it. Uh, President Karzai has very openly and then uh, very frankly said that we are ready now to take over the, the responsibilities. Of course, we will still need uh, your participation, the donor participation, and the United States. So we don't have to worry about a uh, security meltdown in Afghanistan after the U.S. troops withdraw? I hope not. I hope not. We will do to the best of our ability, and all the past 10 years of involvement, training, and, uh, and assistance that we have received, we should be in position to do so. How important is the cooperation and the role of Pakistan in ensuring that, that the next decade in Afghanistan is a, is a, is a peaceful one? Very much so. We are very closely uh, talking to Pakistan, and mm. there's a directly head-to-head -head state visits mm. and various meetings that we have all attended. They have shown all the goodwill to us so far, but I hope they'll continue to do so. <laughs> Saba, you, you know, you've experienced the U.S. troop withdrawal. It's, 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 it's amazing. You know, when the U.S. troops leave, it's, it's easy for a country to fall off a nation's front page and out of a nation's attention. I mean, from your perspective... Is, there, is Iraq being danger, you know, in danger of being forgotten and, and for, ignored by the West? First, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of my government and our people to thank U.S. and American people and Western allies for helping us to remove Saddam Hussein and his regime. Because that regime, who destroyed over 4,500 villages, killed over... 200,000 people displaced, over 100 people through Amfar campaign and so on. And we are grateful to U.S. for this. And we will hope that U.S. will continue in Iraq, staying in Iraq, until we solve some of the main hot issue. Uh, one of the main issue, the relationship between the region and central government. And one of the important issues for us is one of the articles uh, in constitution with American help with the political leader to write for Iraq about Article 140, about the disputed area. There are many, many uh, towns, main cities like Kirkuk and Qin and others. They were originally uh, Kurdish towns and uh, villages. And the previous regime uh, did their best to urbanize this area, remove all the Kurdish uh, people, Kurdish, uh, from their home, from this city, and uh, move Arabs from Baghdad and other places to this to urbanize this area. And these are belong to the Kurdistan, and we hope that America will be able to put some political pressure and play a great role, political and diplomatic role, to solve some of these main issues. Thank you. Thank you. Abid, uh, we'll open it up to questions in, in just a second, but I just, uh, Abid, want to bring you, bring you in. I mean, I want to bring you back in a way to the, to the business side of it and the trust issue, because, you know, the, the dreams of, of the Silk Route depend so much on trust, but if India is doing trade with Afghanistan, there's mistrust in Pakistan. You know, if, if Pakistan is, is, has, a, has its own issues of trust with Afghanistan as well. So there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of mistrust. I mean, how do you overcome that mistrust? And, you know, is the Indian business community, which is represented here, has it got a role to play in sort of building closer links, in lobbying, and in trying to sort of build greater trust between the, two, the, the region as a whole, I guess? <coughs> 
Yeah, I think uh, trust will will uh, it takes time as 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 between friends uh, between countries also it uh, it uh, it takes time and um, it's uh, and it's a process that we must start at some stage. Um, I think that that process hasn't uh, really kicked off as much as it should have, considering we've been neighbors for 60 years. Uh, we should have been very good friends and should have trusted each other with our lives. But I don't think that's happening right now. So uh, one one approach is for the businesses to take the initiative. You're right. Bus we do business here. They do business there. It's uh, it becomes uh, you know you you have to in that situation trust each other. Uh, the other things are. Uh, you know, people-to-people -people contacts, as Mr. Shafkat was mentioning. mentioning. I mean, th that's something that always uh, uh, increases trust. And uh, <coughs> in general, usually you don't um, uh, shoot your customer or, you know, per people you work with. So, um, in general. I'm, I'm I would hope so, <laughs> yeah. uh, But, uh, so, I mean, if the business uh, activity between the two countries increases, we, we talked about non-tariff barriers, uh, we talked about this... Uh, agreement that these guys have uh, signed, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, but it was signed a year ago, mm -hmm. and it's not been implemented yet on the ground. I'd like to find out why not. Why Why hasn't it been implemented? Sam, uh, maybe you want to I should be delighted. <laughs> I should be delighted to do that. As a matter of fact, there has been so many visits between Kabul and Islamabad on this subject. There's always little last minute things are just, you know, <laughs> blocking here, blocking there. I think this will be one of the best things which will happen. Yeah. And uh, thanks to uh, Secretary Clinton that she intervened in that and, and assisted us to, to put this together and sign it. Yeah. But the blockages, I suppose, we are ready. As a matter of fact, uh, I need not to say that uh, the educational material, the books, which is for the education, were blocked at the Karachi airport for months and months and months. And yes, we people. even and we even have a, a sort of pleaded in many ways to the foreign ministry in Pakistan as well as, uh, as to the President Zardari to say, these are books for the children. Right. So I'm saying we, our, our problems are in that. But let me just a little bit, uh, take it a little further, this issue which earlier was mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I like to see in the, in the entire South Asia which couple of things are missing. One of them is, as he as, as rightly pointed out, former minister, the connectivity and the trust as well as integration within our own people and our own uh, uh, countries. Even though we are a group of people from the same region, same language, perhaps same religions in many ways, and in culture and everything else, but yet we are a little bit far away from each other. We have not connected. I do recall that in the SARC summit in the Malay, which was this last uh, year, which was, uh, happened, one of the key theme was how we should be integrating further. Mm -hmm. And I think this is called for us to a little bit work on the connectivity mm -hmm. as well as, as, uh, as integration of it. And I'm sure this will bring a lot of uh, you trust mean in beyond it. Bollywood and cricket. I right? would <laughs> say so, yes. Well, luckily, let me just interrupt that. Uh, no, no, no. For the for the cricket, Afghanistan yeah. is very new to very it. Very impressive. Very but impressive. But we are, the progress of thanks the to team. our neighbors from Pakistan, uh, helped us quite a bit in that, and we are going very well in that. Good, good. Well, let, let, on that note, let's bring it out to the audience and have some questions. Yeah, uh, at the front there. You can, uh... Thank you. My name's Jasmine Whitbread. I'm the chief executive of Save the Children International, and I'd really like to hear a little bit more from the panel about the evolving state of affairs for actually the majority of your populations in all your countries. That's women and children. And actually, when you, you just touched on books for, for, for children, I, there have been some quite significant strides made in the last decade. I'm thinking about particularly in Afghanistan, a halving of child mortality rates. You've got a whole generation of children graduating from school now, girls and boys for the first time in, in many, many years. Um, and there are advances being made in all of your countries. And I suppose my question to you would be, how important are those advances to you as business leaders? Because it's not just a humanitarian issue in my mind. You know, it's the right thing to do. It's also this issue of investing in human capital, which we all know, you know, evidence from other countries is necessary in order to, 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 to build medium and long-term economic growth. 
Um, so I'm just wondering what safeguards, what steps you think could be put in place in your countries to to overcome challenges, whether it's to do with corruption or to do with financing or to do with security, um, to ensure that the progress that's been made on health and education in particular, those investments in human capital won't be, won't be lost. Thanks very much. Uh, I mean, everyone where thinks about this issue in relation to Afghanistan. Thank you very much. No, no, it's a very right. Um, uh, particularly children and women, for example, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the Constitution of Afghanistan guarantees 30% of the entire parliament has to be women. Now, whether we have that qualified woman, for example, yet. But anyway, we, the president said, pick them and bring them and put them on the chair so that let them grow on the job and then learn about it and the next generation would be certainly very fully ready for it. So that's something is, is concrete is happening. The, uh, the, the, the woman which has uh, taken a very prominent role in Afghanistan, is very well covered in the, in the old journals, the international press, and all kinds of things, and we have made quite a bit significant. As a matter of fact, today was supposed to be one of our deputy speaker was here, but maybe next time she will come. On the children's side, you will be surprised. Uh, just last year, I was driving somehow very early in the morning, around 6 o'clock, and what do I see? Young boys and girls holding hands and just walking on the path going to school. It is six o'clock in the morning because we have a school buildings maybe not to the level which are, are so much of it. So the schools have started shifts. Six o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock is, is, is the young, youngest children where the mothers bring them and so on and then 10 to and further until nine o'clock in the night where the little bit more older people come in. So it is moving on quite a bit on that part uh, in the, on the children's side. Of course, we have uh, quite a bit of assistance from the community, donor international community to make it push and so on. You so rightly said, on the, on the health sector, for example, uh, our clinics, mobile clinics, for example, in the northernmost uh, region of the, uh, the plains of the, of the mountains, which is not easy, but is going on, uh, we are just continuing on, 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 on that path. So on the MDG goals of the United Nations, I think Afghanistan has done very good on the health sector, which is recognized now all, all over. So we are on our way, and hopefully we'll continue to be on, on that path. Uh, we want to have an, uh, someone want to take the Pakistan um, point? Of against things like corruption, financing, um, and, and security. Well, I mean, there are two aspects. Very quickly, I'll answer that, and I think you want to say something later on. First of all, in our uh, plan, which we announced about uh, two weeks, uh, two months, uh, six weeks ago, we have uh, promised to double the expenditure that the government will make on health. And in that, we have particularly identified uh, uh, ch the children because uh, the statistics for stunted growth of, of children who have not been who are malnourished and so on are so high that that has b we have made that into a, a very very specific uh, target of our uh, policy and we've stated that and we've gone, gone ahead with that so uh, doubling the expenditure on health and and this and a whole lot of governance things because it's it's not just uh, that you put more money into it, but you, you, uh, you manage health better. You have a better way of, and you get communities involved. You're very much go, going in the direction of getting communities involved. Um, so it's, there's a whole thing. I, 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 just, I just don't want to take too much time explaining that, but uh, rest assured that that is one of the key planks. But on the security side, um, we, there are some areas where we have a security problem. That's not everywhere in the country, but there are some areas in what we call FATA, which is the federally administered tribal tribal areas, we have a security problem. And uh, what we t spoke about earlier, that we have a plan for peace. And unlike, uh, you know, many other, uh, and it's not a one-point agenda to go and kill them all. I mean, there is a, we have a very comprehensive plan of, uh, how we will go about it. And therefore, that will also hopefully, over a period of time, improve security. We have some security issues in, in, in Quetta, one of the cities uh, in Balochistan. But uh, we have some sorts of security issues in Karachi, but that don't, 
that do, they don't, don't impact the, the common people. So by and large, the security is for us an issue. I would not say it's not an issue. But it's not a massive issue. Right? It's not an issue which over, uh, over, overleaps everything else. So, but any, anyway, uh, let me assure you that uh, if we ever make it to the government, and I hope we will in about six months' time, uh, health is going to be one of the main uh, objectives of our uh, policy. Abhi, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to uh, add one thing. I think we have a, uh, in Pakistan, uh, we're infamous for violence against women. And as a citizen, I think we're not doing enough um, to stop that. There are not enough safeguards in place. Uh, and also bringing women into the workforce, not enough is being done. Bring, educating young girls, not enough is being done. So, so there's no safeguard in Pakistan, right? So, uh, but one thing, what, um, but one thing I'd like to, uh, um, one thing I'd like to, as I'm, as I'm an apolitical citizen. So, uh, one thing I would like to uh, say, though, is that our media has become very free over the past 20 years, right? So that, uh, oh, 10 years. So that gives us um, uh, a natural kind of a safeguard. So when something really bad happens and it gets reported, you know, attention is put on it. So, uh, uh, but that's, that's not the right, in my, that it's not a, a procedural thing, you know, it's, uh, it happens once in a while. So that's, that's uh, what I would like to add. Most welcome to Java. Yes, I think um, I could uh, talk about Kurdistan, not the whole Iraq. <laughs> um, Kurdistan uh, being called another Iraq. The main priority for investment for KRG, Kurdistan regional government, was inv invest uh, investment in the security. Uh, we never had any violence, never had even a single incident and we enjoy peace uh, and secure place. Uh, and only uh, people, they come to the Kurdistan, they realize, they make their judgment that Kurdistan is different from the rest of the country. Women, as far as women are concerned, I think we have got equal opportunity. In our assembly, we have got over 25% of MP, they are women. Uh, in education, Priority for investment was security, then power, and now the education and health. We are investing a lot in education and health. One of the main programs, for example, uh, during the last two years we are doing, the government allocated $100 million to send students to study outside the region, outside Iraq in U.S. and uh, Western country. And this year, we have nominated, through a process of transparency, uh, 2,000 uh, public sector employees, as well as a new uh, graduate to study abroad in different subjects according to the need of the uh, region. And we are and we are very, very proud and a very, very successful uh, program because it is equal opportunity. Even I can say maybe women, they are more than men as well. They're competing according to the scoring system which we put in place and the transparency is known to everybody, every member of uh, public sector uh, through websites, through uh, internal communication, and they could apply and go through system and select it and then go through the procedure uh, and going abroad to study for all subjects. Health, the second priority, government uh, going through a good program for reform because we inherited a very out of date system because the region was neglected by previous regime and we are trying to rebuild. And also we uh, learn a lot from experience of other countries. We have got some uh, good organization like RANT, uh, UNESCO and other helping us to put in place uh, a system for health which benefit the whole population of the region. Thanks very much. Uh, Abi, just very quickly, um, did the shooting of Malala Yousafzai, is, is that 
going to change anything in Pakistan, do you think? I mean, it was a bit of a wake-up call, but is it going to have any lasting impact? I mean, I think uh, the what we s sometimes believe that there's a silent majority in Pakistan uh, of uh, enlightened, uh, more enlightened people uh, than you would uh, see on TV. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I think that majority sort of spoke up. Uh, right. uh, or if they're a majority, it's unknown, but those people spoke up. Uh, so hopefully... Uh, it might it might have a positive impact. Right, absolutely. Let's get another question here from the front. Um, so my question actually is to Mr. Mahmoud. Um, post World War II, Jean Monnet, working with the French government's planning department, looks at the new social contract to really access the coal mines uh, for the French. Um, do you possibly see? any such common ground, uh, which does not include Kashmir, uh, on which India and Pakistan could develop a social contract that would at least allow for both the countries to increasingly get interdependent in certain way at least, uh, because that's what happened to France and Germany in a sense, laid the foundation of what we today know as the European Union, so. I don't know whether I would use the word social contract between two countries, but uh, if you mean that a contract on lots of social issues, yes, that would be true. A kind of detente, a kind of contract in which we agree to be, uh, you know, good trading partners, good neighbors, uh, good uh, social exchanges, cultural exchanges, sporting ex Yes, of course. France. Mm -hmm. So do you really think that there is a possibility in that kind of a situation to review the Indus Water Treaty, uh, which is a common ground between the two countries in terms of uh, looking at power, water, and many other uh, aspects that surround that treaty? And do you think re-looking really at that treaty would sort of be a stepping stone to look at a different kind of collaboration? It could end up being a backward step because the point is that uh, when you, ha when you have a treaty which has lasted for uh, since 1960, so we are talking of uh, 52 years that that treaty is held and it has governed essentially a, a treaty which is accepted by both sides and which is uh, occasionally led to international arbitration also. So I, I, I think that uh, what has worked, we should leave that well alone because if we if we touch it, we open a Pandora's box. I mean, there are lots of people, by the way, in Pakistan also who think that Indus Water Treaty should be reviewed because uh, uh, there have been some river waters have been given away uh, which shouldn't have been given and I'm sure there are lots of people in India who feel that way. So my, my only point is that we are neighbors, we can't wish that away. We, are, uh, we have to live together, we have to find ways to cooperate, we have to find ways to share the resources which are common to us. I mean, uh, talk about uh, Air, for example. I mean, if there is pollution in India, it have, or in pollution in Pakistan, in a few days it travels to each other. If there is, uh, there are, uh, there's sewage water which goes across the border or comes across the border. So there, and there is water, and there are lots of other issues. So what I'm saying is that we have absolute, we are convinced, and by that I mean I'm reflecting my party's point of view, and as a citizen of Pakistan, I hope that we are convinced that. It is vitally, uh, it is in our vital national interest, and I think in your national interest also, I'm assuming you're from India, that uh, we must work together. We must resolve our problems. We must move forward. We, these, these, uh, we must make these very hard borders into relatively softer borders in the sense of greater freedom of people to move uh, to each other's countries. And I think that is where I, I will stop because I can see the moderator getting a bit restless. <laughs> <laughs> well read. Yes, yeah, so we are running out of time. I'm going to um, just have to take one more question, and then, and then I'm going to ask each of you just to give us, if you can, in a, and I'm just going to spring this on you a little bit, but if you can, in a sentence, just give us a sentence that you'd like to you know, sum up what you want this forum to take away from your country, your, con you know, your, your, your presence here. Um, just, just to sum up what you're, the message that you're doing, which is, you know, as I said, I'm just spring that as a surprise on you. So, so you've got a couple of minutes. But there, there was a, yeah, there's a, 
There's, there's two questions there. Why don't we just take them both in quick succession and, 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 and then just get a quick answer and then do the sum up. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I'm Prakash Hinduja from the Hinduja group of companies. Uh, we do business with Afghanistan and in Pakistan. We are hoping to go on exporting of our Ashok Leyland vehicles, which we are in process of doing it. But we are also focusing on the economical development between the two countries, because I know the you know, the resources which Afghanistan has are tremendous. Their mines, their different minerals, what they have. We haven't discussed that the World Bank and the various other countries could create a focus on creating economical development between in, uh, India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. If these three countries come across an understanding with the three, you know, areas, it can bring a lot of success and win-win situation, which can offer to all the three countries. So we have to work out a plan with the programs, with all the three countries, how they can come to understanding to bring the success of problems. They can sit together, solve the problem, and create an agenda so that it can review all the time to bring the economical development. Great. Thank you. So thank you very much. And uh, just the, the gentleman behind you has also been putting his hand up sometimes. So just give him the chance. Uh, my name is Anilesh. I work co for a magazine called Business Today, uh, which is published by India Today Group. Yeah. I wanted to ask the panel, you know, there are uh, two developments which we are seeing. One is America is becoming, you know, self-sufficient for their oil needs and their gas needs. And China is now sourcing, uh, you know, a bulk of oil and gas from the uh, Middle East. Do you see any paradigm shift in, you know, geopolitical situation, especially relates to, uh, relating to the Middle East and, uh, you know, the Islamic world? So do you see any change happening in the near future? That's my question. No. I think we really are running out of time. So, so why don't we just combine that with a final, with a final remark and, and just, you know, Mr. Hindrich's point about the, the potential of regional cooperation and just, just uh, and, and the point about the, the other point from the, the gentleman of Business Week. And then just make your final comments and we'll, we'll leave it there. So we'll start with, with Chan. Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's a very good question. And this is what basically Afghanistan wants to continue on that path. It is true that we are privileged or we are given, you know, our land and so on, that we do have uh, mineral resources and so on. And of course, uh, the country is mountaineers. It takes lots of time and energy and, and efforts and investments. To, to, to go for it. We cannot do alone by ourselves. So we have to rely on, on the foreign investments and so on. As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Induja may know that already, that uh, just a few months back, if I'm in the month of July or August, uh, India hosted a, a, a specific investment summit for Afghanistan, where we invited basically for the whole, whole members of the whole region. So we believe that uh, for all the logistic reasons, uh, 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 we are more closer to India, Pakistan, Iran, Central Asia than, for example, somewhere else. So the, the resources could be literally developed and invested by the region. is good for them, good for us, and so on. So actually, within that context, I do wish to recognize India's economic assistance to Afghanistan, which is in, in a much larger scale. And within that context, I'd like to see our regional cooperation to develop more. I think we got to work within our global or regional foras or within our own bilateral relations. We have to develop our regional cooperation, not necessarily in, in just connectivity and so on, which I earlier said, in the investments, in the, in the trade, in the transport, in the transit areas, as well as uh, uh, manufacturing. This morning, for example, one of the sessions which says, you cannot develop if you don't have some manufacturing. Now, we don't have. So India has, uh, has, a, has a quite a bit experience and this capacity, so they can share with us, within, with, with, with us as well. But it's true that India is helping quite a bit Afghanistan, and we thank them for that. Right. No, thank you very much. Uh, Saba, do you want to um, The only question I would like to uh, answer is about the oil and gas. Again, uh, in the region, the region is very... Uh, wealthy in uh, oil and gas, uh, and we don't prefer or prefer any country when we have got tendering and put all the rules and regulation and ask for all international company to bid uh, for this contract, uh, and we select the right company 
to do the right uh, job. Thank you very much. Abid, you want to... Uh yeah, I'd like to um, uh, sum up with, uh, if I was uh, asked, you asked that what should people take away from, from the forum? Uh, I, I would like that you should take away uh, or share my vis vision for the region. I would like an, uh, a prosperous, peaceful, enlightened, tolerant region. Uh, and everybody has their work cut out to make that happen. And, you know, let's get, get on with it. Let's get on with it. Great. Thanks very much. South Coast. I, 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 <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I endorse what Abid has said, but I'll just add that um, uh, we get a lot of bad press, but Pakistan is a very vibrant country with a, a rapidly uh, emerging, expanding middle class. It's got a wonderful infrastructure, great water resources. Really, I mean, uh, when you look at uh, undocumented economy, which is which is perhaps uh, equal the size of the economy that exists is documented. I mean, there is a huge potential in that country. So what I would like uh, uh, friends to take from this region is number one, that there are great opportunities in Pakistan. And uh, uh, number two, that Pakistan wants to, uh, and the, I speak for uh, the political leadership of the country, that Pakistan wants to play uh, its uh, leading role in trying to create a region which is uh, a region of peace, trade, uh, people to people contact, actually something like a European economic community, something that emerges as, uh, you know, really truly uh, effective trading uh, partner with each other. So I think that's where um, Pakistan will not be lagging behind. Well, that's, that's great to hear. Um, a clarion call for regional cooperation, a tolerant, connected region. So uh, let's, let's uh, hope the politicians can make that happen. Uh, yeah, just just I would like to uh, thank the World Economic Forum for inviting us. It was a golden opportunity. Uh, the forum which I uh, very much uh, liked and trust because this partnership between the politician and uh, the public sector and private sector is important to work together. And this sharing experience and knowledge is very, very useful for all of us. And thank you very much for this invitation and this opportunity. You, thank spoke, you spoke on behalf of all of us. Indeed, yes. indeed you did. Thank, thank you all very much, for the, all the panel, for such an interesting discussion. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. And I won't keep you any further from, from drinks tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.